All right, everybody, welcome back to another edition of the Teardown. My name is Jeff Gluck, along with my coworker Jordan Bianchi. We are motorsports writers for the Athletic, and we're here to talk about the regular season finale, the Southern 500 at Darlington Raceway. Jordan, you are live on site. Technically, the race was yesterday since you were in the wee hours um, of Labor Day there, but um, you're not going to have to labor to talk about this race because this was a <laughs> this was a gem. This was the kind of race where you go, oh yeah, this is why NASCAR NASCAR at its best is pretty damn good. This was a fantastic show, thrilling, everything you'd want out of the regular season finale. Great stuff. Jordan, you were there to witness it. What did you make of the whole night? Wow. I don't even know where to start. I, I guess the thing that comes to mind is we talked, we've talked so extensively on the show we, about how Daytona is the great regular season finale and how it's the ideal track. It's got this unpredictability and no offense to Darlington. You just don't have that. You don't see surprise winners here. There are no upsets. You kind of know who the group of winners is probably going to be from a group of like six, seven, eight guys, right? All of these things. Yeah, forget all that. <laughs> forget all like we had an upset winner tonight. It was fantastic racing, though the middle part of the race was eh, it was okay. But I mean the beginning and the end were were really, really great. Um it was old school. You had guys on different tire strategies, you you saw guys pushing it, saving their equipment, some others. It was like it was everything you kind of look for in a race, the twists and the turns and the drama, like this delivered. I mean, this was if you want to look at like almost a near perfect race, this was it. I mean, flashing back to a year ago, um, you're telling me, Hey, I'm about to break the schedule. And, uh, guess what? I'm, I'm hearing that NASCAR is going to put the regular season finale at Darlington instead of Daytona do the Olympic break. And, immediate reaction is, oh man, like they had something <laughs> perfect with Daytona. And yeah. now, as you said, now you're not going to get that magical win your way into the playoffs. You're not going to get that at Darlington, maybe Eric Jones, but for the mm. rest of it, it'll be Daytona. That'll be the last sort of wild card race. That'll be the last hope for everybody. And then maybe you'll have a nice little points battle for the regular season finale, or maybe for the playoff cutoff spot if we're so lucky to see that but we're not going to see new winners competing especially multiple as we did tonight with <laughs> chase briscoe and kyle bush both going for it in the final laps i mean what more could you possibly ask for than this with not only all the stakes on the line for a regular season championship for the playoff spot um, to win your way into the playoffs and then being a crown jewel race. Let's not forget this was yeah. the Southern 500 um, <laughs> sold out. I mean, just, just great. Uh, just phenomenal stuff. Um, Darlington just consistently. I, I think Kansas is NASCAR's best track, but uh, right now Darlington still seems to deliver every time. It's just so great. Yeah. It challenges yeah. these guys. It's it. The degree of difficulty is extremely high. You never feel like anybody's getting any freebies. There's no uh, comfortability. You, no, not at all. Even every second you're like, well, I mean, somebody could scrape the wall. It, it could go wrong at anybody for any moment. Um, it's just um, awesome stuff. It's just what racing is truly all about. Pushes these guys to the limits and it takes everything. Um, just, I mean, man, I was very satisfied. Somebody watching this four hours it kind of flew by in a sense, right? Like you're like, well, this is going to be a long race. It uh, did because it, it they, they started stage three and I looked at it and I went, man, we got a lot of laps left. We got a lot of laps left. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh wow, we don't have a lot of laps left. Like this thing is almost over with. And it, it, it did, it, it flew by it. You, you see here how hard it is to do this, the skill set, the run on a, on a, worn abrasive track that you're slipping and sliding you're up against the wall i mean you, you, the best of the best you know kyle larson's bouncing off it a couple times like you see the skill and you know all of the debate that we've had you know that's been going on in motorsports of larson versus verstappen it's like i want to see a max verstappen come here and do this because this is damn hard like people don't realize how hard this is and it's physically demanding these guys get out of the race car and they're spent like it is really really difficult well uh one thing is that you can see the driver's skill 
when you watch a Darlington race and you can see that the guys, there's some guys that just get it right. And they're just they're They understand how to run the wall. They understand how to do all those things. One of those people's chase Briscoe and you had flashbacks tonight to the 2020 Xfinity race where he is going all out against Kyle Busch to try to win it. And, uh, he ultimately gets it done in front of no fans. Um, I think it was like the week after they just had, um, a miscarriage. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was a very emotional time for chase Briscoe, but he was able to outduel Kyle Busch back then for that big win at Darlington. And, um, it was one of that part of that magical season for Briscoe where it, it kind of launched him into the cup series. If I'm remembering correctly, um, so he gets this opportunity on the bigger, way bigger stage tonight, and he's able to deliver despite being on older tires after Kyle Busch had tracked him down. I thought, I don't know about you, I thought for sure, absolutely without a doubt, I Kyle Busch you. is going to get him. I messaged you. I said, like, I said, Kyle, like, the restart, I, I messaged you and I said, Kyle's going to win this race. Like, Kyle is going to win this race. He's on fresher tires. He's restarting like sixth or seventh, which isn't that far back on fresher tires here. And then he got a great restart. It's like, okay. And he just he got close, but he couldn't close it out. And Briscoe, to his credit, on worn tires, did everything perfect. Like, it would have been really easy for him to get in the wall, make a mistake, overdrive, all of these things. And he didn't do it. And a credit to Kyle. Kyle didn't do anything silly. Like this was no erupt, you know, they didn't repeat the Austin Dillon thing. Like he raced Briscoe straight up and they both raced hard and it was great to see. Yeah. I mean, look, I, you know, I think had Kyle Busch gotten a little bit closer at the, at the very end there, maybe he tries to put the bumper to him or something. I mean, Kyle maybe, Busch raced it, people yeah. clean. I'm not saying he would have wrecked him, but um, there might've been some contact if it had been that close. Maybe but bottom line was, I mean, Briscoe had it. I mean, it was, uh, I, I, you know, when, when, first of all, Kyle Bush to clear, I mean, I think he went from like 10th to fourth or something on the restart. And then he was quickly up to third, up to second. And it was like, all right. I mean, and, and once they, they kind of leveled out, he just didn't quite, couldn't quite get there, uh, you know, with, with air and everything like that. But man, um, you're seeing flashes there where Kyle Bush not done yet. Can't stick a fork in Kyle Busch quite yet. Um, he's had chances to win this year. He'll he'll look back on you know some near misses this year. I mean, you you think about the Atlanta three wide finish for him and Chris yep. Busher, uh, who we'll talk about in a minute here. Um, all these guys that missed, you know, can look back and say, "Man, we we had this chance here. We had this chance here." But the bottom line is, with this system, as we said at Daytona with Harrison Burton. It's all about winning, right? I mean, you have the 11th place guy in points. He didn't make it. I mean, Chris Busher, 11th in points. Bubba Wallace, 12th in points. It wasn't good enough. Martin Truex Jr., 10th in points, only made it by six, ultimately, tonight. Um, this is a system that is all about winning. And I think, again, this how this regular season has ended post Olympics break. I mean, let's say Austin Dillon's win had stood. You would have had 15 different winners counting toward the playoffs. As it was, you had 14 count toward the playoffs with only two spots available on points. You almost had only one. I, I just think in the future, you have to go in and forget points. Yeah. Points you, you can you can say, oh well, I mean, what Ross Chastain had a 70 something point cushion at something to the to the cutoff line, you know, before the Olympic break. And it evaporated and he was trailing. But still, even then, it wouldn't have mattered. The entire Busher Bubba Wallace discussion was irrelevant because you had they they would have had to win because Briscoe yeah. won. So I think you in the future you just look at this and you go, All right, we have 26 races to win. We have to do it. If we don't, we're probably not gonna make it. If straight up, yeah. you are probably not gonna make it. You cannot assume anything because the way that these races are. The way, with how many wild card type events there are, and even on the not wild card type events, like a Southern 500, you have a surprise winner. So, to me, I think it's the beauty of the system. I like the win and you're in. I'm fine with it. I think it's it's cool. But I understand you're you're not getting all the best playoff drivers in there. Okay, that's fine. But I like what this has given us for the first 26 races of the season. I think it's a great regular season. 
it's fantastic regular season. If you come into the regular season now, you have to have the mentality of we need to get a win. We'll worry about getting points and everything else and worrying about the champion, the regular season championship later. But first and foremost, we have got to win to lock ourselves in. There was a time not too long ago, we we I have this discussion. Oh, you know, you get a rash of winners at the beginning of the year. And it would be, oh, are you going to have 60? You're going to have more winners than playoff spots? We'd have that conversation. Like, no, doesn't happen. That's not how this works. Usually levels off and you get 12, maybe 13-ish. You know, that's not the case anymore. Really since... We've gone to this next gen car, 2022. You look at it. it every year now, you are maybe going to have two spots open, you know, and the Dylan thing doesn't happen. That really throws a monkey wrench in all of this. You need to win early in this system to have take that pressure off because the longer you go without win, it doesn't matter how big your point lead is. Martin Trix Jr. at one point was like a lock. We all considered him a lock because of his points. But other guys win. You get a Burton win. You get other Briscoe win. You have some bad races in a row, and all of a sudden your margin that you thought was insurmountable, and you thought, hey, I'm good, I can look ahead to the playoffs, that's not the case. It changes everything. This system is rewards winning, and if you want to be in the playoffs, you better guarantee yourself a win. Otherwise, you are going to have a very stressful stretch run to the end of the regular season, and that's what we saw today. Chris Buescher, by the way, fourth best average finish this year. Didn't make the playoffs. Ross Chastain, sixth best average finish this year didn't make the playoffs. Like that's great. They had great consistent years. And if this was an older format and a different format, that would be rewarded to some degree. But that is not the format here and now. The here the format here and now is win and get in at all costs. And it's why I said what I said about Dylan and I understand in that moment of why he did it because it winning matters so much. You know, the thing about Busher is, you know, he had the fourth best average finish, just didn't get enough of the great finishes, right? Yeah. But you can easily look back at his season and go, man, I mean, look at this guy. He loses the closest finish in NASCAR history at Kansas. He gets taken out by Tyler Reddick at Darlington, as they we saw replayed multiple times tonight and this weekend. Um, there was There was chances for him to win. It, so it's not like, well, you know, too bad. You know, it, it, he just didn't have it. I mean, there was chance for him to win, just like with Kyle Busch, just like, I mean, you, you can go through the whole list, but bottom line is you have to get it done, and it underscores how difficult it really truly is to win. Again, we went into this race tonight thinking JGR or Hendrick. This is where the powerhouses come back to play, in, in my opinion. Uh, you know, it, this was going to be the heavy hitters race. All they had to do was not worry about points for the most part. They were locked in within one or two points of their playoff position. They could go out and just go for the win as they're bringing their stuff for the playoffs and win a crown jewel race and, and show off their best stuff. And who gets it done? Stuart Haas racing and chase Briscoe <laughs> who let's see. Now he is, he ended the regular season 17th in points um, going into tonight, he was 18th in points. So, you know, he was in contention points wise until around June ish. And then it started fading away. But after he faded away, everybody thought, well, I mean, good try chase. It was nice that you were able to stay in it as long as you could because Stuart Haas is going away. People are starting to leave the team. Um, they're not getting as much information. I saw an interview that Matt Weaver did with Greg Zipidelli tonight after the race. And Greg Zipidelli says, yeah, Ford is, uh, you know, cutting off our information. I, you know, he said, I have guys here at the track come to the track, their laptops don't work. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they've been, a, it's been an uphill battle. It's been a, it's been a huge hurdle to climb for SHR to even just keep people together. And, you know, it's, you could tell the people that are still there take a lot of pride in the company They've been beaten down all year. You know, the, the people that are left there are just trying to go out with some semblance of respectability. You know, it's, it's been tough. It's been, it's probably very demoralizing all year to come there to work. Um, it is. And you look at the balance of you're trying to focus on the here and now and do well and have that pride and carry through. And in some, you know, Briscoe's case and everyone on that 14 team is like, Hey, we still got an outside chance to make the playoffs. Like we still have a fighting chance. 
but at the same time, you're looking ahead to the future of where, where are we going to go? What am I going to do? Where am I going to go work? What opportunities are going to be out there for me? It's, it's a really delicate balance and it'd be really easy to say, Hey, I'm forget about this year. I'm looking ahead to next year. You know, if you're the driver or your crew chief or somebody there, it's like, this is, they don't care about me here. Obviously they, they prove that they, they shut this place down. They don't, they treated us. However, you know, Richard Boswell's interview, I think on NBC tonight really kind of underscored that, that, that the sentiment there, you know, you, it's, it's tough. And when you're looking at this, this organization, it's like, this was a team that, this was a, a team that not too long ago was one of the best. Like it was the big four, you know, it was one of the big four in the garage. It was Gibbs, it was Hendrick, it was Penske, it was SHR. And then it was everybody else. And they have fallen and they have fallen hard. Some of it their own doing, some of it not. And it was nice to have them at least have one last moment in the sun before they shut the doors. I mean, huge, right? Like the the amount of pride that everybody there must feel at this moment and the amount of pride that Chase Briscoe must feel for getting those people in the playoffs. That's what Austin Dillon was trying to do for RCR, right? Like to... Mm-hmm. You walk into the shop and you know that you're carrying everybody on your shoulders and you're just trying to win for all those faces, those hundreds of faces that you can picture in your head. Um, I'm sure this means the world to Chase Briscoe, the world to SHR to have some sort of little like, yeah, that's right. Like you threw everything you could against us. Our team owners put us in this position Ford. People that left, people that didn't want to stick out the year put us in this position. And guess what? We still did it anyway. And we beat some of the best teams out there to win this race and to get that final playoff spot. That is a badass statement. I bet that feels pretty damn good. I mean, that's got to be awesome. It's great. And it underscores this ability that Chase Briscoe has. Like we've seen flashes of it at times where you're like, wow, this, this guy has the potential to be one of those consistent winners in this cup series. And other times you're like, this guy, is he ever going to put it all together? And tonight showed you like, you give him a great team, you put him on the right racetrack. It's like, he can go do it. And he did it. And it's going to, it really, to me, it sets up well is because He's going to an organization next year where he doesn't have to worry about any of these things. Like you're going to a turnkey organization where it's, it's they think championship, they, they, they prepare for the championship. They do everything they can to go and compete for the championship. They don't have any of these instability issues that SHR has had the last few years or leadership questions. It's like, you really feel like now Frisco is going to have an opportunity to go there and really flex and, and show everybody, Hey, I am that driver that people used to rave about in Xfinity, you know, after that 2020 year when he had that monster year. And I'm that driver who in in 2022, I went and I won Phoenix and I beat everybody. And we haven't seen a lot of that driver because some of it's his own doing, some of it's the organization's doing. But tonight really, again, showcase at, at NASCAR's toughest track where ability here matters almost more than any other place. He did it, and he did it by being a two-time former series champion. Yeah, and I, I totally echo what you say, right? Because you're like, man, sometimes you think, oh, yeah, absolutely, Chase Briscoe going in the 19 next year. That makes total sense. Like, this guy is, you know, overachieved in some senses, and he's, you know, done really well. And then other times you're like, I don't know. Like, there's been situations where he overdrives and, you know, is thrown a race away or something, and you're like, ah, I don't know, maybe not. But then again, nights like tonight remind you the talent that this dude has, uh, it's there, it's there. And, uh, when you put all the pieces together and put him in a position where he can go win the race, um, he's going to get it done. So very interesting to see now, Jordan, I don't think that a lot of people would have, um, had this, uh, would have, would have bet a chase Briscoe victory straight up. No, nope. listen to dirty mo Doe. Um, I don't know that a lot of people would have had this, but if you did, um, you should probably be doing that on FanDuel because uh, you've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you haven't been playing it, um, now, now would be a good time to start because these playoffs are going to be crazy. We have something a little bit different for you, though, because now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. I mean, NFL Sunday Ticket's about as good as it Oof, you've, for free. Three weeks? Oh my gosh. 
Then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. So just go to fanduel.com slash teardown to download America's number one sports book. That's fanduel.com slash teardown. Please use our code, not anybody else's, to download America's number one sports book. Uh, you must be 21 and present in North Carolina. Full price of NFL Sunday ticket will automatically be charged seasonally after the free trial. No refunds, terms and conditions, terms, restrictions, and embargoes apply. Gambling problem? Call 877-718-5543 or visit morethanagame.nc.gov. Well, there's some other things that I don't know that people would have been on tonight from this race. Uh, I guess we can go back briefly to start at the beginning and kind of cycle our way through. I don't think that people would have wagered on Martin Truex Jr. and Ryan Blaney being eliminated on lap two of this race. Um, Southern 500, it's the kind of race where the veterans go, hey man, 500 miles, this is going to be a four-hour race. You don't need to try to be a hero on lap one. And the most senior (laughs) driver, the most veteran driver in the series uh, makes a mistake on the first lap, or second lap, I guess, third lap, whatever. And uh, he's done. Puts himself in playoff jeopardy. Again, only makes it by six points. Um, and takes out Blaney as well. Hopefully Blaney's wrist or hand is okay. That was a little He said bit. he's okay. He'll say it'll be okay. Yeah. So we'll see. See how it feels tomorrow. Those things can, those kind of injuries usually take a day to, you really feel the ramifications of that. You know, the, the adrenaline wears off and then you wake up the next day and you're like, ooh, that hurts. Well, I mean, if you don't want any sort of even a sprain or something, but if there's any sort of problem with that, uh, you know, it's one thing to go to Atlanta next week, but then you go to Watkins Glen. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that would not be good for a wrist or hand injury. And then Bristol, well. when you're con- continually just you know yanking the wheel there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, it's not. So hopefully it's not he's a, okay. Yeah. But that did that that wreck did cost Ryan Blaney two spots in the standings which was worth two playoff points to him. So um, I think he is the number, uh, Ryan Blaney's number five seed. I guess he would have been the number five seed anyway, but he has, I think, 13 playoff points, maybe instead of, uh, yeah, instead of 15. So you never know when that's going to come back to bite you. Martin Truex Jr. is the lowest seed. Um, He has zero playoff points. Zero, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I, th- I think that, um, is that right? Let me look here. I, I don't think that Martin Truex Jr. won a single stage. He's got three, play- he's got three playoff points to what I'm oh, looking at. Oh, he did? At. Yeah. Oh. oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, well, I'll take right. it back. But, I mean, your point stands, though. Like, I mean, he doesn't have the cachet of points that he usually has going in the playoffs. Oh, because he finished 10th. Yeah. He did finish 10th in the standings. So he got a, he got one point for that. Right, I, yeah, I have, I have him as ten. I have him tenth in the standings because yeah, I guess he made it from being tenth because he, if he was eleventh, he would have been out. So there's one playoff point. Yeah, I and guess he won he, some he stages. Won two stages, this, I guess. Yeah, uh, I, this has three. NASCAR.com has him winning three stages oh. this year. Have we still not gotten the points? Right. We still haven't gotten sent the points. Oh, they, here they are. They're in our inbox. Good Lord, they're in our inbox. Okay, uh, three playoff points for Truex. So. He it says he has what three stage that? wins, but he doesn't have. But he should have gotten a point for being top ten in regular season. I think he has four. He should have four playoff points. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, sorry. Well, I mean, it's kind of important to know who has the most playoff points. No, you don't care. Well, it's not Truex. I can tell you that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and my point about Truex is, he doesn't have a lot of playoff points, and that's going to put him in a bad spot. Like this team has been running up and down. Uh, some weeks they look like they have speed. Other weeks they're they're off a little bit. They've had a lot of bad luck. You look at a year ago, Martin Truex Jr. came into the playoffs with a ton of playoff points, and it carried him through the first two rounds because of the underperformance. This year, if they have underperformance, they're not going to have that to fall back on. You factor in that they're going to Atlanta, or who the hell knows what happens there. And by the way, Truex has never won on a drafting track before. Um, Watkins Glen is going to have a lot of tire wear, apparently. And so how, we don't know how that's going to unfold. Then you go to Bristol. Things are going to happen in this round. There, There's going to be carnage. There's going to be guys who are going to have to be digging out of big holes. 
And it is going to help you immensely if you've got those playoff points to fall back on. He doesn't this year. And it's a weird year because, you know, I don't know, halfway through the year, we looked at him as one of the guys, like one of the favorites. We were talking about him in the same kind of breath as a Hamlin and a Larson and a Byron. And no, you know, Truex didn't win races. We're all like, he's going to get a win. He's going to win, you know, win a race here, there. He's going to start racking them up. Didn't happen. And now he's going in to the playoffs with zero wins, very few playoff points, and his back against the wall. Martin Truex Jr.'s last season, uh, his last playoff is going to be a grind. And they're, the playoffs are always tough, but it's going to be even tougher for him in the the points deficit he's facing. Yeah, I mean, I have no faith um, in Truex whatsoever to advance very far. I mean, dating back to the last last year's playoffs, when he had 30, 36 points entering the uh, playoffs, 36 playoff points, to now have three or four, whatever these various things say where they're not, they're not all in agreement, but not a lot and to have no momentum at all. Um, I mean, they're just way off. I mean, looking at his season, Martin Truex Jr. Has one top 10 finish since July, since late June, one top 10 finish. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's not good. His last top five, was in May at Kansas. So I don't see how you're going to make it very far doing that. Um, no, and, and again, they will, they've will they not had great luck. I mean, they have had speed, but you know, they lost an engine at Richmond. They were fast at Michigan. They've had things crop up and, and kind of knock them back a little bit. But again, you've got to figure out a way. Um, he's not leading a lot of laps either, which is always a big statistic that I look at. You know, 28 laps at Michigan was his high uh, since Dover. I thought going into this race, and I, and I told people, people were asking me, you know, throughout the weekend who I thought was going. I thought Truex was my pick to win the night. I really did. And I said, this is his, I feel like this is his last best chance to get a win on the year. That doesn't mean that, you know, you look at the schedule and playoffs, there's, there's good tracks for him. He's, you know, Kansas, obviously, and Homestead, and Vegas. But this felt like a Martin Truex Jr. track. And it felt like if he's going to get a win, it's going to be here. Because then you start looking at it and you're like, you got Daytona and you got Talladega. You don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if Truex is going to get that win to end his career the way he wants to. I know he wants to. He, he said it. he really would like to do that and go out and have won that one more moment. But looking at it, it's it's hard to see that unfolding that way. Time's definitely running out. Not good for you as well, because not only did you pick Martin Truex Jr. <laughs> to uh, win tonight, Looking at our preseason picks, um, you picked Martin Truex Jr. to win the championship, um, obviously in your final four as well. Um, we will give our revised final four and champion, but um, that I, I assume you're going to be changing your pick. You don't have to spoil it, but you're not going to pick Truex Jr. Yeah, to uh, no yeah. offense to the Truex and the 19 team. I'm, uh, I'm going it's to, not, it's not you, it's me. Um, I'm going to make a change. We're breaking up. Well, Jordan, for the third straight year, um, although this wasn't as bad of a jinx, making fun of myself as well for my preseason picks. And that same piece where we make our preseason predictions and I picked the biggest disappointment of the year. You'll recall that two years ago, I picked track house racing to be the biggest <laughs> disappointment. Then both their drivers won races to make the playoffs. Ross Chastain almost won the championship in a magical year. Last year, I picked RFK racing as the biggest disappointment. Uh, both drivers ended up making the playoffs. This year, I picked Stuart Haas Racing. Chase Briscoe, to start the year in the 12 questions at Daytona, said, I'm so glad you picked us because that means we're going to be in the playoffs. <laughs> and all year, I thought, I'm, I don't think so, Chase. It doesn't appear that way. I think I'm going to be <laughs> correct this time. Waits until the last minute, but gets that buzzer beater. So once again, they're not the biggest disappointment. I was wrong yet again. So, uh, you know, well, you're wrong. I'm wrong. It's okay. I don't, I mean, I don't think you're necessarily wrong. I mean, they, they ran so bad. They're closing down. I mean, I mean, there, there's I, I other, my the biggest they're, disappointment. They've, they've run I mean, actually I, better than I they've think run better most than, people they, thought. Yeah. I mean, they've ran right? better than I thought, but I mean, I don't think they, they, this isn't like a track house or an RFK, RFK situation where they like completely blew your prediction out of the water. I mean, 
No, you know, but I mean, the biggest disappointment would probably be like Legacy. Oh, yeah. it's Right? I mean, if you're going to say biggest disappointment. Probably. I mean, I had Eric Jones in the playoffs, so I, I would say yeah. Legacy. Just they, they have struggled bad, but yeah. I, I'm anyway, trying to give a you a little bit of credit. I don't, I don't no, think I Stuart, That's very yeah, rare, I mean, and I wasn't expecting that, so thank no, you. No, but I mean, you even look at it. I mean, look at Briscoe, I think, in the last like seven races. He had no time. I think his best finish was like 15th over like the last six or seven races. It's not like, the, you know, they have been good. It's... It's an interesting year. It's it's been a year where there's been different stretches where it look you know beginning of the year you go back look like William Byron wasn't going to lose a race and it looked like it was gonna be William Byron's got this monster regular season. I feel like I don't know how Kyle Larson didn't win like seven races this year, including tonight. Like how you know here, Michigan, Iowa. Like there there's so many races this year and you're like that should this should be a Larson win, and it wasn't. Um, Martin Truex Jr. Doing Martin Truex Jr. things in his final year, he's running well. I think you know led the standings for a little bit, right? He's doing all these things, you know. Denny Hamlin looks like, oh man, Denny Hamlin's going to win the regular season. Then he, he kind of that was his his speed didn't taper off, but the results went away mm -hmm. through various reasons. Like it's just been in really Ford. Like, let's talk about Ford. Beginning of the year, let's there was a conversation. <laughs> yeah, like the beginning of the year, like what are we talking? Is, is Ford ever going to win a race? Like, right. What's going on with Ford? Like, oh my God, they're having this miserable season. Oh, by the way, I mean, they you look at the numbers, they got more drivers in the playoffs than anybody. <laughs> That's what it was. You know, I'm adding up tonight all the what the manufacturers have for each one, and Ford, as you said, ends up with six playoff drivers, the most of anybody. Chevy and Toyota have five each. Okay, well. You look back at it and I'm like, well, why did we think Ford was so bad? Oh yeah. They didn't win a race until mid May with Keselowski at Darlington. That was their first win of the year. Mm -hmm. And that was the 13th race. That was the halfway point of the regular season. They went almost the entire first half of the regular season with no wins. And then they end up with the most drivers in the playoffs. What? And I still don't even think they're that good. <laughs> like, you go into this going, oh yeah, we're gonna gonna put multiple Fords in my final four. I'm not. I'm think I'm gonna maybe put one, but yeah. Uh, actually, I don't even know if I'm gonna put one. So anyway, we'll get there. But you know, it's just like wow. I mean, this. And again, if you if you back up to all this, right? If you back up, even before the Olympic break, before the Dylan thing at Richmond, and before Daytona with Harrison Burton, and before tonight. I mean, to me, NASCAR continues to be at its best when it's giving you unpredictable results. This is so far from the big three. Oh, yeah, there's, it's one of these three guys going to win every week. Oh, who's going to be? Oh, this guy again. You know, where you just turn on the race and you know what's going to happen. And you're just like, ah, all right. I mean, this was a regular season where it just felt like nobody ever really had a super strong advantage for that long of a time. I mean, you talked about the guys going in waves and the up and down, but we never had like sort of two or three months of one consistent guy to me that was like, Oh yeah, that's the championship favor. That's guy, to, the, the guy to beat Reddick came on late. Let's talk about Tyler Reddick. I mean, Tyler Reddick from 2311 outdoes all the big boys from Hendrick Motorsports and Joe Gibbs Racing. Wins the regular season championship by one point while well, we thought he was um, pooping and puking, but uh, turns out anyway. no, nothing, nothing actually came out. Jordan is, you know, if you ever meet Jordan, don't tell him any of your bathroom stuff because he doesn't want to hear it. Even if you say, I'm going to pee, he doesn't want to hear it. Anyway. He doesn't want to hear it. See, he's already trying to move on. Jordan does not want to talk about anybody's bathroom stuff, but Jordan, you were the one, one of the ones that tweeted about Tyler Reddick saying he was. I'm reporting the facts. I can't choose, pick and choose the facts I report. Okay. But I think you make a really good point overall about this is a huge accomplishment for 2311. This is a team that just started in 2021. They went out, they beat Penske. Hendrick, they went all the big boys. I mean, Hendrick's celebrating its 40th anniversary. Gibbs has been around for 30 years. Penske's been around for you know nearly as long, if not longer. This is a huge accomplishment. Teams don't get started up in NASCAR and go win regular season points championships. That's not how this works. And you can sit there and talk about you know Trackhouse racing. It's a unique situation. Trackhouse 
bought an existing team and they're still, there was a fund, the foundation was kind of already in place. This was a brand new team from the ground up that they built. It's incredible. It, it is remarkable. I asked MJ about it. I asked Denny about it. Like, this oh, is. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on, everybody. Hold on. Hold on. Everybody, stop the podcast. No, we've no, got a, We've got an announcement. We've got an announcement. Jordan is trying to just slyly slip it in there, slyly name drop. It. Ask MJ about it. Jordan Bianchi, podcast co host, right here on the teardown, has interviewed. Michael Jordan, sound the sound the horns, everybody. He's done it. <laughs> Career accomplishment. I've heard this Jordan say this fifty times. I want to interview MJ. That's my goal, my life bucket list goal. What's number one thing on Jordan Bianchi's bucket list? Get talk to MJ. Guess what, folks? He freaking did it tonight. Jordan Bianchi, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, tell us about your MJ interview. Uh, well, I went down to Bubba Wallace's pit, and MJ was down there, and then asked him how Bubba did, and then followed him down pit road. And he, I was curious. So I was walking with MJ, um, MJ, we're tight, you know? And so he calls me JB. I call him MJ. It's cute. We have this little <laughs> thing going on. Um, I was curious where he was going to go. I'm like, is he going to go congratulate Reddick? Is he going to walk down to Bubba? How is he going to do this? But he didn't make it all the way down pit road. He stopped at the makeshift victory lane. They had to, to celebrate Reddick's championship. And he was milling about for a while. And I was talking to another reporter and, Looked at him like, yeah, looks like, you know, MJ kind of looks like he's enjoying this. Like he's in a good mood. And you just had that look of like, this guy might want to talk. Like, you know, this is the opportunity. And so I talked to one of the co-owners of uh, 2311 Racing. I said, uh, what do you think? You think he's open? He's like, oh, yeah, go for it. Like, All right. So I just slid up to him and asked him a couple questions. And he gave a great answer. And he, he was right. Like, this was this is a huge accomplishment for a team that, you know, they don't have 500 employees like a Hendrick Motorsports. You know, they they have, you know, Denny was very emphatic. Like, we've got less than 100 employees at this place. Um, we, we don't have that maybe the amount of resources that some of the other teams do. I, I can't state enough what an accomplishment this is to go win a regular season championship. You can talk about the championship overall. And we've talked about that format and how maybe it's a crapshoot or But this was a team through race one through 26 was the best. And that is a really a big deal. And they deserve all of the applause for that, for building a team from the foundation up in investing in this and having a commitment to continually growing from one car to two cars to maybe three cars. You know, the, the new the new race shop, like this is a team that is in this to win it. And they show that they can go race with the big boys and beat them. So, um, Again, hey, predictions are predictions, but <clears throat> did have somebody on this podcast did have <laughs> Tyler Reddick in their final four, said he was going to have a good season. I didn't pick him to win the championship regular, their regular season. I wouldn't have been that bold, but thought he was going to have a good year. My concern was, you know, we've seen that the team various times that let him down this year wasn't the case. They, they put it all together, this, these 26 races. I think he's in a good spot to make a run. I mean, the, the tracks shape up well for him. Uh, there's road courses out there. Uh, he's fast on intermediates, obviously. Um, he could he could easily do it, but a lot has to go right for a lot of people. But um, we'll see. I you know I, I have about five minutes here, ten minutes before I have to give my official championship pick. So um, more on a clock, yet, but what? We're on a clock. Well, I'm just saying later in the show, later in the show, okay. I'm, I'm going to get there. Tyler, um, Tyler yeah. Reddick's growth is he continues to impress me because this was a driver who, you know, would make a lot of mistakes and would have issues closing out races. And the team would have some mistakes on pit road. And it was like, what, you know, if they could put it together, like you, you could see it, but like, were they ever going to put it together? They've done it. And they, the issues that they had, a year ago where it was like, man, what, what is going on with these guys? Are they ever going to get out of their own way? Like we haven't said that this year. The only thing we said about them is, you know, can, you know, can tie their clothes out a race, but finishing second isn't bad all the time. You can string those together. Like he has, like, that's an accomplishment. And that was the moment. And, you know, I talked to Denny Hamlin afterwards and I said, when was the moment you realized that, you know, Tyler Reddick was here to play and like he could win the regular season championship. Like it was those second place finishes. Like he was doing it consistently and running up there and starting to string those together. And it's you go back and you talk about this year and how it's evolved. 
I don't know when we started talking about Reddick. It feels recently. Like we both realized like, wow, he's, he's in the mix here. Cause it, we, we really haven't spoken a lot of him all year long. You know, I know he won a Talladega in the spring, but even then it was like, we were always talking about other guys and it, it wasn't really until the last month or so he really kind of came to the forefront. We're like we, we need to start being mindful of him and really kind of giving him his due. I mean, it looked like for a while there that, I mean, when Kyle Larson was storming away and doing well on the stage and stuff, it didn't look like Reddick was going to be able to do, it, especially with his stomach issues, but maybe Jordan, it's safe to say that he gutted that one out. Did he gut it out? <laughs> Very good. Maybe he didn't, he didn't cough that one up, Jordan. He didn't throw it away. Um, he didn't throw it away. He did not. He didn't crap the bed. Oh, Jordan. <laughs> Can I ask you a legitimate question? I know you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to. Are you trying to move on from poop and puke again? Yeah. Yeah, we are. We're going to go to your favorite topic, actually. Oh my God. Are you going to talk about waivers in Indianapolis? I just and... wanted to ask you the question. So good Lord. Okay. Do you think there's any, they, they mentioned the broadcast tonight. And, I, and it's a legitimate question. I mean, do you think there's any tinge of like, man, we we could have won the regular season championship no. if not? For, okay. No, I think there's I think there's absolutely tinges of regret about you. You just mentioned about five minutes ago of all the races Larson threw away this year. Yeah. There that could have been wins for him. That you said he could have won seven races, and you I named mean, multiple times when he should have won and and gave away points. I think. No. If anything, they would look at those. Oh man, we could have gotten twenty points here, thirty points here. You know, I don't think they're looking at him running. You know, he's not going to go Chicago. Oh. I forgot about Chicago too. He started on the pole in Chicago, was running top five, puts it in the barrier. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a there's lot, lot of right. I mean, seriously, they're they're not going to look back on man. If it only hadn't rained, any I wish I hadn't done the Indy five hundred. So. I could get one more point and get oh. five more playoff points. There's no way that Kyle Larson, you think even Kyle Larson, ends, even if it ends up dude, Kyle Larson, you think Kyle Larson is regretting just asking, Indy 500? I'm asking a question. No I, it's a, way. It's just ask. I didn't, I didn't say that. I asked I mean, you a question. Can, you can, you're, you're certainly, anybody is certainly welcome to say, well, that's the moment. And those are the five playoff points. And if he misses one round by five points or less than five points, that's when it'll come into play, right? Like you'll say, oh, well, there you could if you hadn't missed Indy. But I'm telling you, the way Kyle Larson would think about it, there's no way he would Oh, yeah, go. no, I, yeah, I know Kyle's not, but I'm, you know, I'm just wondering. You just said, curious. do you think there's any regret or tinge of no? So I'm saying no, no way. I think, okay. Right. I think there's no way, no way. But I understand that that point will definitely be brought up. By the way, he, the number five team did win the regular season owners owners yeah which is setting us up for a little bit of an interesting thing because one team has more owners points playoff points than the other so you could see a difference in rounds again oh that's gonna be an exhausting topic if that happens but owners still tell you they care more about that championship than the the driver's championship that's the one that pays denny tweeted tonight finally won a championship you know as an owner asterisk and then Larson <laughs> tweeted, well, not technically, uh, because his team won the owner's championship. But anyway. Um, That's good. Yeah. So speaking of um, decisions, Jordan, of course, we're on to our safety culture segment now. This segment is sponsored by Safety Culture, which is the workplace operations platform giving teams what they need to get the job done quicker and improve every day. Safety Culture, a better way of working. So let's talk about some key decisions in you can say either this race or I'll get I'll give you the entire regular season to get Tyler Reddick to this point um, over Kyle Larson. Hey, you in fact, if you want, I'll throw it out there. You can say a key decision <laughs> was Larson missing the six hundred. But uh, take it away. What's your What's your key decision? No, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna let okay. you go first this week because I'm I'm kind of bouncing around. I didn't know we were gonna do the whole season, by the way, either. So, well, I wasn't planning. I'm just opening it up to you if you if yeah. you want to. Um, no, for me, I think, I mean, you could look to a moment where something was strategy or, or, or whatever, but to me, the, the key decision was chase Briscoe decides to make a pretty bold move there. Three wide sweeping down to the bottom 
in a moment that he had to have. And in a moment where Chase Briscoe has not always come out on the right end of these daring moves, Bristol dirt race or something like that, right? Like, uh, it's, there's been times when he goes for it and it doesn't work this time he went for it. Um, you know, there's no guarantee that it's going to stick and there's no guarantee he's going to be able to hold off Larson in that moment and pass Chastain in that moment, all that stuff. But the way it worked out, he got himself out front. That was a huge moment and a key decision. So that's going to be my safety culture pick for the, for the key decision of the, of the, of the race. What do you think? It's a great pick for this race. I, I like that one a lot. Um, big picture. There's two moments that jump out to me overall this season. Both of them are probably not highlights for the particular drivers involved. One goes back to Richmond in the spring race, Martin Trix Jr. And that restart, if you know that goes the other way, is that was that Martin Trix Jr.'s last best chance to get a win? You know, the jumped restart. He, yeah, the jumped restart there. Does he gets that win? Then we're not having the conversation of hey, his final season. Is it going to end with a, a, a zero in the in the win column? Like at least he's going to have that moment, and so that one jumps out to me. And honestly, the other one happened at Richmond as well. It's the Austin Dillon thing because you know you the decisions there. You maybe don't do the second act, the part of that act of that that where you hook Hamlin. You you know you probably win. This, maybe you win the race, or just that whole sequence unfolded. Um, to me, had so many ramifications because the win got stripped away. Hell, I, I'd throw Ricky Stenhouse's decision or whatever happened there with him and Priest and that caution. Um, that doesn't happen. Austin Dillon wins that race running away, and that really jumbles the playoffs, and it's a whole different conversation we're having. So those are kind of the key moments throughout the, the year that I look at and say, wow, like you make a different decision in that moment, you know, what is the outcome then? And, um, you know, Denny Hamlin would have five more playoff points if he had won that race, that Richmond race as well. Sure. Um, so it wouldn't have hurt as much to get his taken away. Um, so I'm seeing again, sorry for the, you know, I, I, I've read some different playoff point totals. I want to go back and clean something up from earlier. This other points report I'm seeing has Kyle Larson with 40 playoff points. Um, Christopher Bell second with 32, Reddick 28, Byron 22. Then you have Blaney with 18, Hamlin 15, Chase Elliott 14. Those are all the guys in double digits. Brad Kozlowski, 8. Joey Logano and Austin Sindrick both had 7. Suarez has 6. Bowman, Briscoe, Burton have 5. This says Truex has 0, but I know that's not true because he has 3 stage wins, as we said, so that's wrong. I think he has 4. Um, and then Ty Gibbs has 4 as well because he got 2 for finishing ninth in the standings and he got 2 stage wins. So I think the lowest person uh, are is Truex and Gibbs with four, but uh, it goes all the way to 40. So, um, you know, hey, it adds up, but it doesn't guarantee anything as we have seen. Um, so listen, the other safety culture key decision I think would have to go, you know, it, the, I, I don't know how you, how you put this on Busher, but there was a chance that he, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if I'm remembering this, I, I don't know. Am I wrong that he could have roughed up Kyle Larson at Kansas at the finish? Felt like he could have been probably more aggressive in that situation. And then not even like necessarily rough him up, but I think he could have probably drove Larson off the track more, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a, it was a conversation coming out of that race of, you know, how could you have done more to, to be more assertive? Because then Larson if I'm remembering in my head, he Larson kind of initiated contact after, yeah. you know, coming down the track, he kind of door slammed him busher and busher had driven him clean up to that point. And then it felt like, I think that the, the narrative was sort of like, well, next time I get in that position, I'm not going to be as, you know, I wouldn't do that necessarily. Um, but you know, you hate to look back at those moments and, and penalize someone for being a clean driver, but an, an inch cost him a playoff spot. It's so Kyle Busher, a like a conversation thing. with you two on that one <laughs> for a Atlanta being, finish. Uh, well, no, just being oh. how a clean, how being clean cost oh. him. Well, I mean, are you talking about for Daytona or? Yeah, I mean, he raced clean. Harrison, he raced Harrison clean. Yeah, there. If he doesn't I'm race, not gonna, he's not going to turn somebody. A no, no, I'm not. Speedway, I'm, though, but, but I mean, right? I'm just saying though. I mean, it, it, you've changed how you race guess, in that yeah. situation, and yeah, but it's. I think, Busher at Kansas, you know, coming to the finish, 
is a little bit different than Kyle Busch like turning somebody through the grass at a super speedway. I don't know. But anyway, it's all part of key decisions. Uh, and that goes into the, the safety culture uh, theme that we're talking about. So again, some of you, you might not be familiar with safety culture. Uh, it's a workplace operations tool that gives teams what they need to get the job done quickly and improve every day. But what does that actually mean? Well, obviously, if you're part of a company, a business, a team, etc., efficiency is everything. No matter what you're trying to achieve, no one has time to waste from construction sites to factory floors. Safety culture is designed to drive improvements, not just in safety, but broadly across quality and efficiency too. It's all about meeting higher standards by bringing the whole team onto one page, all from their mobile device. We know that Trackhouse is not only a sponsor on Shane Van Gisbergen's car, but they are a big believer in the safety culture app. They use Safety Culture's app to manage everything from pre-race inspections on the car to assembly checks, even in-house training, all on their very own operations platform. So if you're a team leader, the Safety Culture app can help you get greater, greater visibility across your whole operation so you can make confident decisions fast. If you work behind the scenes, Safety Culture can give you access to the knowledge and tools to ensure your success and help you make every second count. Are you ready to put your workplace in the pole position? Head to safetyculture.com SVG. That is safetyculture.com slash SVG. By the way, SVG was in this race tonight. Um, and you thought would have thought, well, I don't know. How's he going to do? Southern 500? That's a lot. Uh, I thought they kind of had an interesting strategy. Colleague did in that 16 car, um, trying to have him run way long the first stage. I thought he was going to get buried. But you ultimately look at the end. He finished P26 um, for a guy that with not a ton of cup oval experience at all. Um, P26, I think, in the Southern 500 is pretty respectable, I, I think, personally. But um, speaking of that, finishes that need to be highlighted, spotlighted. Let's talk about Corey LaJoy really quick. Corey LaJoy, you know, totally overshadowed in all the playoff talk that we're discussing, understandably so. P9, first mm-hmm. non-super speedway top 10 in Corey LaJoy's career. So uh, when the guy is looking for a job or talking to teams about a new ride, good timing. Corey LaJoy really needed that finish, I think. A lot of happy people on the seven team on pit road. Uh, ran to his crew chief, Ryan Sparks, on pit road. And Ryan, it's been a goal of his to have a top 10 finish on a non-drafting track. And they check that box. It's in the year they've had. And the frustration that it has been, and the, and the you know the unfulfilled promise of if they've had been fast cars at times, and they haven't gotten the finishes. It's good for them, and and they did it here, and that's that's no easy feat. Tenth, uh, top ten of Corey LaJoy's career, but again, um, he's had one, two, three, four, five of those at Daytona. Uh, he's had two of those at Talladega, and two of those at Atlanta. Um, so. This is the one I think, hey, look, I mean, if you were going to say, hey, where do you want a top 10, like a straight up top 10 on a non-drafting track, where would you like that to be as like the feather in your cap? You'd say Southern 500, Darlington. So um, that's, I'm sure, much needed for that team. Um, who else do you want to talk about here? I mean, you know, we had Ross Chastain. He finished his fifth, but it just wasn't going to be enough even before all the craziness. Have, What's up? No, they didn't have speed all weekend. No. Like they, 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 they didn't qualify well. They didn't race well. The, the finish was largely a byproduct of strategy and a, and a caution. Um, they just were not fast. And it's been a problem for Trackhouse overall. More than one team than the 99 because they've been able to knock out some top 10s. One team hasn't been good. They just have not ran well consistently uh, in the second half of the year. And the beginning of the year... When they had speed, they didn't have some luck on their side. Um, I don't know how you you miss the playoffs. It's obviously disappointing, but this actually feels even. It's just it 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 it's especially disappointing because this team should be better than this. And they they had opportunities they didn't capitalize. And we we talk about how when you have opportunities to win races, you've got to go do it. They, this is a team that left a lot of points on the table this year, a whole lot of points on the table. You know, it's if you take a step back. Um, you know, you look at, you know, you, if you, if you would have just said, if you would have told us before the year, okay, Daniel Suarez is going to make the playoffs and Ross Chastain is not in terms of the track house drivers. Obviously both of us had Chastain in, we both had Suarez out. Um, 
the Atlanta three wide finish makes all the difference. But if you take a step back at it, track house racing right now is a team with it's two drivers, at least in-house drivers, 14th in points and 18th in points for the regular season. So that's where they are. You know, it's like they're, they're just, it, they most weeks don't seem to be good enough to run up front and challenge for wins. Every once in a while you see a flash of speed and you're like, okay, there you go. Um, maybe they're, maybe they got something here, but it, it just never felt like all year that they were the track house of 2022 or the first half of 2023. Even after Suarez, um, you know, was able to, to win that Atlanta race, obviously. But, um, yeah, so we'll see how Suarez can do. But, I mean, I'm sure when we make our playoff picks, he'll be probably an early out for, for both of us. I don't see him making a deep run. I just don't think Trackhouse has been, you know, a team that looks super strong at the moment. I mean, they look like just sort of a, a B-level team. But they're not. But they were. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go please. I'm just saying, they're not, they're not like junk. By any stretch, but they're just not, you know, top tier contending in terms of speed. What they look like to me is Chip Ganassi Racing, where Chip Ganassi Racing would would have these moments, these year, and they pop up and like win some races, and they'd be like, "Wow, okay, wow, okay, they they look good. They might, you know, they're in the mix." And then the next year, for whatever reason, they'd fall off the map. It was always this yin and yang of we never knew what you're going to get from that. It was inconsistency year to year. Trackhouse Racing's origins, if you look at it, they're found, you know, they're they're Chip Ganassi in a lot of respects. And that this is they bought the, the charters from them, they moved in the building. There's a lot of the employees are there. And it still seems like it's in the DNA over there, in the it's in the water, right? That this you you're gonna have one great year in 2022. Last year it's eh, it's a mixed bag. And this year it's been, you know, outside of Suarez winning in Atlanta, it's it's been underwhelming. I don't really know if we talked about specifically too much about Bubba Wallace, but, um, you know, definitely disappointing for him not to make the playoffs. Your teammate wins a regular season championship. He's 12th in points, respectable. And he would have made it had there not been two winners in the last two weeks, of the regular season, unfortunate, but again, you have to expect it. I think just for Bubba Wallace, you know, they, they struggled to put it all together. They got it going late. They found speed. Um, and he could very well win a race before the season's over. But unfortunately, it's just too little too late. Um, and you got to win. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I just had to win. He, he would have had to get 30 more points to catch, uh, almost 30 more points to catch uh, Truex, I think. So, uh, which was ultimately, that's where the cutoff line was. So, you know, um, a win makes all the difference. You know, you some of the people behind Bubba Wallace and points that did make it, Alex Bowman, he would have missed the playoffs without a Chicago win. Joey Logano, 15th in points. Joey Logano would have missed the playoffs without his Nashville incredible fuel savings moment in whatever that was, quadruple overtime or something. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Um, obviously, Chase Briscoe. Obviously, Daniel Suarez, Sindrick, Burton. Um, you know, what is that? Six drivers behind uh, Bubba and points? Mm -hmm. Something like that that made it? So he did enough points-wise, but again, just like Busher, it doesn't, doesn't do it. He's going to have to, you know, next year, I think Bubba's just got to come out and just go, you know, don't even, don't even worry about the points. I mean, like, just go for wins. Like we said at the top of the show, you... you He's got his cars have the capability of winning. Go for wins. Is that fair? Yeah. A couple things. One, one stage win this year. This team has not done a very good job of not just winning stages. They just haven't done a very good job of getting stage points. And it's been it's that that has certainly added up. They had a stretch this year over nine races. They had eight top eight finishes outside the top ten. That's not going to cut it, especially when you look at some of the there's the, supposed to be some of his best tracks. Talladega, Kansas, Charlotte. You know, look at those places like you have to go there and maximize it. How he has ran as of late over this last really since the the going into the break, because he had a great run in Indianapolis has been great. You have to take this, though, this this six race stretch or whatever this is. And you've got to do that over 26 races. 
And we have seen that from this team. At times, they will have stretches, and they're knocking out top 10 finishes. And you're like, okay, all right, this is what we expect. This is who they are. And then they have stretches where they go nine races, and they finish outside the top 10 eight times. Too inconsistent. If you take what they did the last six weeks or so and bottle that, they should they can do this. They they can win races. They should be good enough. They obviously build great cars over there because Tyler Reddick just won the regular season championship. But the reality is, this is year four for Bubba Wallace at 2311 Racing. He's made the playoffs one time. He's won two races. That's tough to swallow when your teammates, Reddick's won two races each of the last two years, just won the regular season championship. That's hard. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on Bubba next year to, you know, the spotlight's going to be, hey, you, you've got to take that next step. And what that is, some of the things, you, you know, you can't control. You can't control getting wrecked at Michigan when you've got a fast race car. You can't control tonight in a race where you really did. He did a great job. I, I don't, and I can't say enough. Came here, won the pole, finished second in stage one, earned a bunch of stage points. He did what he was doing. He put himself in a position to keep knocking down that total where, you know, Chris was on the ropes and, you know, but then the speed went away a little bit. And that's another problem with this is that sometimes that that's, they, they don't do a good enough job of staying on top of it. And the car fades a little bit. You got to stay on top of that. We, you know, and they got back in traffic there and they got caught up in a wreck again, bad luck, but you've got to be, you've got a way to put, not put yourself in those positions where you're like at Michigan, where you're in the middle of the pack when you've got a fast race car. Sometimes that's unavoidable with, with pit stop cycles, but too often it seems like they find themselves in these spots where they shouldn't be. And then bad things happen to them. Jordan. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to NBC, uh, watching this for four oh, hours. At so home tonight. good. I thought they were great. They had a great broadcast. Lee Diffie's continued to be uh, phenomenal. Really enjoy his addition. And then, um, you know, the, the explaining what was going on, the race, the tarts all over it. Oh. At the end, they got the triple box going. Box so good. The tri box was amazing. That was perfect for all the action. It really made it feel like a big moment. They got Michael Jordan interview mid race. Yeah. And he was great. He had some emotion. I mean, it just, just felt like they were all over the storylines. Uh, great coverage. I will say, um, our friend, Kim Kuhn, are you sure you wanted to stand that close to Tyler Reddick after the race and interview him after he had a stomach bug? It's professional. Kim, I hope you don't get, do job. get sick. I don't know. I don't know. I, I hope I you didn't, you didn't get close to Tyler Reddick. Did you? No, I kept my distance. He like, he, after his press conference, he came up to, to Bob and I, and he's like standing right in front of us. And I'm like starting to lean back. I'm like, Oh God. Yeah. Cause I got to drive. Like, just, I got to be just, next to you during just, media day just, coming up. Yeah, and then I got to drive in a car with you for four and a half hours from Charlotte yeah, to Atlanta on Friday. That way, so would, please sir. don't get a stomach bug, please. Yeah. But it always happens that your kids. Of course, his kid gave it to him. That's, That's why such don't the have life kids. of a parent, you know. That's why you don't have kids. You don't have to worry about it. That's why. Okay. It's among the reasons, yes. Any anything else you want to talk about from this race before we move on to? Yeah, uh, I want. Okay. NBC's broadcast really quick. I this might be in the moment. I thought this was one of the best broadcasts for a NASCAR race. I've seen it a long time, like beginning mm -hmm. to end. I thought they did a phenomenal job. They, they, everything, they were on top of everything. The regular season point battle, the bubble battle, like there wasn't a storyline they missed. And it was like, even when, even they had the interview with MJ, but they had the camera on MJ at times. And you just looked hearts breakdown of things of, of laying out the strategy as it was unfolding or even before it was unfolding was so good. Lee Diffie was just doing Lee Diffie things. I thought this was a phenomenal broadcast from green flag to checkered flag. Uh, I'm hard pressed to remember a better broadcast I've seen uh, in recent memory. Jordan, it is time to do a couple predictions. One, the good race poll, and then our championship four picks in our champion. So do you want to do good race poll first or do you want to do our final four picks? What would say? Uh, you're the older member of the crew. So I'm going to defer to you and what you want to do. Let's do good race poll. All right. Big Joe wall chimes in here with the current updated numbers. I have taken a 14 to 13 lead. My here's what's going to be interesting here because we could obviously end up tied. I'm up um, less than four points. I think 3.4 points, if I'm doing the math correctly, 
in the total percentage differential, which is the tiebreaker. So even if I lose, I've just got to be within three point. You can't beat me by three points. So 3.4, I think. So you're, you would be best served to keep that in mind as you're making your guess after I make mine. But so my goal here is to put out enough of a number that puts you in a box where it's going to be close enough to my number that you can't get within three points either way so that I can clinch and get the one regular one point, a one zero lead going into the playoffs for winning the regular season, 26 races worth one point. That said, my guess for tonight's race will be 92%. I was going to go 93. See, that's what I'm saying. You're yeah, that's fine. If you go high, you can go higher and win, but then you're not going to get, it's not going to be, I don't think 95, 96. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to go 93. I, I thought this was just a, this was a Wait, great so you're race. Just I thought, in the it, championship? it is what it is. It is what it is. I'm, you know, it's, it's you very can't hard win to by, wait mathematically. I don't think you can win by guessing. What so I got to guess 97. Like, no, I think you might have to guess lower. Yeah, right? I'm not, no. Am not, I doing that right? Whatever. Oh, so you're See, just you're, you're just giving up. I I win the regular season. I'm just trying to win this. I'll let the chips fall where they may. Okay. I'm not gonna worry about points. I'm you're just not worried about, about points tonight. Okay, I'm not I worried gotcha. about the points. I'm just worried about the you're win. Just going for the win. Yeah. I mean, I I thought th- this race was really really good. I thought the beginning was good. The the ending was obviously phenomenal. The middle portion of this race was it was okay. It was you know it, it kind of dragged a little bit. Um, but still at the end of the day, I think people are going to watch this and go, this was, this was classic Darlington. This is the Southern 500. This is what you want to see. And then you throw in a surprise popular winner and all of that, that entailed 93. And I, and I, there was a part of me that almost thought maybe going even higher. I know I thought about going higher too, but I just didn't want you to box me in too low, but no, I, I look, listen, I mean, this was a great night. This really was a great night. Uh, for what, what the expectations were again, I think this is one of the reasons where, you know, look, sometimes this is a long season and we certainly harp on it on the podcast. It can be sort of exhausting at times being a, being somebody that follows NASCAR is invested in NASCAR. You're like, this is a lot of BS kind of stuff. A lot of like, Oh, not this again, or just some unnecessary drama or politics or something. Right. And you're like, ah, geez, there's some periods where it's just, it's just kind of draining, but I think this race tonight is like one of the races you watch and you just go, ah, that's, that's why, that's why you spend your entire season in four hours or whatever, three, four hours every Sunday, investing your time and emotion in this stuff. I mean, there is a payoff. So this was nice to get, be rewarded with a, a great end of the regular season. I think overall this regular season will be viewed favorably as we said with all the different winners and and all that i thought the racing largely was pretty very competitive this year very very competitive and i think at times we probably over undersold it a little bit i think for the most part i thought the racing is is certainly delivered week in week out when you look at my poll in the the 90 plus percent club this season is on pace to have the most ever it's it doesn't have yet but i think there's it only needs a couple more to tie 2022 which that was an insane season um so yeah i think this this is going to be uh this if the playoffs go well uh this could be a special special year it's time to pick our championship for favorites now looking back on our preseason predictions jordan we each got 12 out of the 16 playoff drivers correct you and i both missed Cindric, suarez briscoe and burton because we had Busher, Bush, Chastain, and then I had Bubba Wallace in, and you had Eric Jones in. That was our only different pick. We had 15 out of the 16 picks the same, except for Wallace Jones. But we each missed four. My preseason championship four drivers were Byron, Larson, Hamlin, Reddick. I am now going to change because I'm going to put Bell in there. And I'm going to take out Hamlin. Um, I'm going to take Hamlin out. 
uh, because I just, you know, he loses the playoff points. I, it doesn't seem like they're getting the finishes. Something always bad happens to him anyway. So it's an easy pick. If it happens to be a reverse jinx, Denny, you can thank me later. I will also take out Byron. Um, although he had a much stronger end of the season these last couple weeks, last few weeks, showed a little bit more speed, end up fifth in points. I don't think they had what they had earlier in the season. And I do like the momentum overall that Ryan Blaney shows. And I am think I'm going to put Blaney in instead. So my final four will be Blaney, Larson, Bell, Reddick with my champion, Christopher Bell. Okay. It's, so it's a, what? No, go ahead. Uh, so your preseason final four, Byron, Chastain, Larson, Truex. Your champion was Truex. I guess I should have said before, my champion was Larson. It will not be Bell. Um, your champion was Truex. What changes will you make to your yeah, there's a lot of changes. There, there's a whole lot of changes. There's a wholesale changes here. We're knocking okay. this thing down and we're rebuilding it. Your final four is incredibly similar to my final four. We have three of the same picks. Oh. Um, I also have Larson. I also have Blaney. I also have Bell. I have Hamlin, though. I have Hamlin you over have Reddick. Hamlin over Reddick. I have, I have Hamlin over Reddick. And I understand they don't necessarily have the finishes. Not a lot of their doing, though. Um, you go back to Indianapolis, running really, really well. How Bush spins, takes out Hamlin. Look at Daytona. That's a crash. You know, it happens. This team is so good. Week in, week out, they bring fast race cars. Like, rarely do they they do they bring a car to the racetrack, and you're like, man, they're, they're just out to lunch today. A bad day for them is the back half of the top 10. Hamlin, there's not a track on this circuit that Hamlin can't win at. You look at the playoffs with an addition of a super speedway race, he can win there. Yes, the road to the championship four is going to be more challenging because of the lack of playoff points. I still think they're good enough to overcome that. I think they probably get a win or two early on and help build that back up. And then if they can get to round three, you look at the tracks in that round. Vegas, Homestead, Martinsville. Three of Denny's better tracks. Three tracks he's won on before. I like this team a lot. Yeah, they may have to be in a situation where it's going to be win or go home. They're good enough to do that. Um, I'm not concerned about that. I think Hamlin is one of the two or three best drivers on the circuit all around. Gabe Hart is one of the best two or three crew chiefs on the circuit. Together, they're gonna. I, I have great confidence in them in getting back to the uh, championship four. And who out of those four will be your champion? Bell's a really good pick. Um, very tempted to go that route. I'm just gonna go Kyle Larson. I it's it's hard to Nothing ignore wrong with that. Yeah. yeah, it's I. I, I'm concerned by the fact that they, again they they feel like they lose more races than they should they 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 should be winning them, but they I, like the eleven more often than not they bring fast race cars to the track and they they don't have many off weeks. Um, a lot of their issues are maybe trying to do too much at times. I think they can curb that. They also they also have a safety net to fall back on where if they get that points hole or something happens. They 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 should be in a position where they kind of get a mulligan, especially in the first round or two. You know, he's got to get through Atlanta. He's got to get through Talladega. You know, we know super speedways aren't his maybe his best tracks, but I still think they're going to be in a really good spot. You go to Bristol if you're in him and you're, you need points there. You know he's going to do a good job there. The Roval, same thing in round two. I just like the way this team sets up. I think they're going to have a monster playoff, and I think we're going to be talking about Kyle Larson when it's all said and done. Look at the numbers, going wow, okay. <laughs> You know, like he's got four wins during the regular season. I, I could see him winning three or four during the playoffs. I just, the, the reason I'm going with Bell is he won Phoenix in the spring. He came mm-hmm. from 20th on the last restart all the way up through the field to win by five something seconds. He then went to New Hampshire and won that race, similar type of track. He could have won Gateway, um, if not for an engine issue, similar type of track. And finally, he has. You know, we've talked for years, oh, Bell just doesn't have the playoff points to, you know, make a run. He puts himself in a position where he's got to he's got to get there other ways. And even though he's made the last two Final Fours, he's done it without a lot of playoff points in the bank. This year, he has playoff points in the bank, 32. So, um, yes, he hasn't, you know, necessarily set the world on fire. His crew chief can't even bend his knees at the moment. Um, hopefully that gets fixed soon um, as he recovers from surgery. 
but um, he'll be back at some point in the playoffs. And, um, you know, I think Bell is just primed to make a deep run. And when he gets there to Phoenix, um, I think he's going to finish it off for his first title. And it shouldn't be a surprise. So I, I think you break up, bring up a very interesting point. You talk about how great Bell is at Phoenix. You could also say the same thing about Hamlin on these type of tracks. You could say, obviously, say the same thing about Blaney. It feels like if the guys that we think are going to get to Phoenix with a shot at the championship, it feels like a battle royal. Where it's like all you could make a very strong case for Bell, for Blaney, for Larson, for Hamlin. And, you know, and I'm just going to throw Reddick in there just out of respect, even though he doesn't maybe have the track record on this on these tracks. But those four guys particularly, it's like they are flat tracks. And it's like Martinsville and Phoenix. It feels like it's going to be a showdown. So um, on The Athletic this week, got a lot coming up. Um, we're going to, I don't want to spoil everything that we have planned, but um, certainly some playoff preview content coming into it. Part of that is we will be at uh, Media Day for um, NASCAR Media Day on Wednesday. Um, we will be giving you a special edition of the podcast from their midweek edition of the podcast, I believe is the plan. So please check back, um, I guess maybe Thursday. I'm not sure when it'll be out because we will be recording um, Wednesday. We will be having all your favorite drivers on the podcast with us. So that's going to be fun. We're looking forward to that. Chatting with uh, all the playoff drivers. <laughs> I bet you they're so excited to talk to us. Yes, they will be thrilled. But we will be thrilled to talk to them regardless. Um, and then Jordan, am I allowed to say what else you got going on this week on Thursday? Or do you not? Am I not allowed to announce Thursday? that? Yeah, you can say. What are we? What are we doing? You. Oh, the we're going to be show? on the uh, the box. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Can I? Can I? Yes. Can we reveal yeah, this? go for it, please. Ladies and gentlemen, our esteemed co-host Jordan Bianchi. Is is going to the TV world? I mean, he's not leaving us. But Jordan, tell us what you're doing. Uh, throughout the playoffs, there will be a show that TNT Sports is putting together. It's going to air on True TV every Thursday night, and we're going to recap the the weekend the weekend NASCAR and also preview the coming weekend. And it's going to be Shan Spake is hosting, uh, Steve Latart, Mamba, uh, a rotating cast of drivers. Kyle Busch is going to be on the first couple episodes, I believe, if I've been told correctly. And it's going to, you know, we have different drivers and it's going to be fun. It's going to kind of the same vein. So TNT Sports is putting this together and, you know, they, they have the Inside the NBA show. Uh, they have the Inside the NHL show they do. Like It's going to be in that same, same kind of vein of a fun uh, you know, round table kind of show, you know, bat banter, that kind of thing. Look at you, you checking <laughs> items off the bucket list left and right. Guy wanted to interview we'll Michael see. Jordan. Check guy wanted to be on TV. Check. He's nailing it folks. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know how big of a role I'm, I'm going to have a very small role in this whole thing. All right. Well, we'll see about that. I don't know. There's nothing small about what Jordan Bianchi just bring into your TV screens, <laughs> folks. We just need anyway, news to talk about every week. That's the thing. New, oh, I'm sure you'll come up with it if anybody. Hey, you broke yeah. the schedule this week. Got um, lucky. Mexico no too. There, Mexico City. Um, any any <laughs> thoughts on that? I, I will encourage you. You're. I don't think I told you this. I loved your piece you wrote on the schedule, rank going through the changes and everything. All 21 changes on the schedule. I thought that was really really well done. So checked out in the athletic. So. I, I like the schedule. I, I think going to Mexico is a, a home run. Um, I think it's going to be a smashing success. And when you have 38 races on the schedule, I think you can do things like this. And you can you can try different things. And I think NASCAR's done a really, really good job. It's got a little bit of everything for everyone. You know, if you're an old school fan, you've got a Bowman Gray. You've got a North Wilkesboro. You've got an Iowa short track that they added, you know, this year. Um, you've got two Darlington races. Like, there's there's things you can point to and be like, hey, this is cool. That's my NASCAR I like. If you're a new fan, like, you've got some cool things. you still got Chicago. Um, you've got Mexico City. I really like the variation of the schedule and how, it, like, there's this always something new. And for five straight years now, they've added a new track. I, kudos. I mean, it's... I really, I know it's not easy, but they continue to evolve this thing in a way that it was, you know, we, we had this, you know, we would have said this five, six years ago, of like, Hey, they're going to do all these things. Like there's like, no way, like no way the schedule from 2001 to 2018, 
there was like one change. It was one yeah. Atlanta date. It was literally Atlanta date fell off and they went to Kentucky. And then I'm sorry, the Charlotte Roval was too. It's like, like, eh, but now it's, I like it. So your thoughts, please. Oh no. I mean, I, I'm very pleased that they're going to Mexico city. Um, you know, there's some elements I don't love, obviously like yeah. Homestead coming out of the playoffs for sure. Um, that's, I mean, I New like Hampshire that. and Gateway in the playoffs are like, I'm like, do we need a l- more flat yeah. tracks? You know? Yeah. But it, it's not like I'm up in arms about it. No, I mean, I don't, I don't love that, but, um, I also don't love what is it? 28 straight weekends sure. end of the year. The record was sure. this year, 23 in a row. And now it's 28 to end the year. It's going to be, oof. but, um, yeah. you know, that's what we all sign up for, I guess, but it's still not, it's hard. And, and I, <laughs> I'm not trying to defend NASCAR in this situation. It is really hard to craft the schedule, though, because you've got Southern 500 that's got to be on Labor Day weekend. And if you want to end the season, the regular season at Daytona, you know, you, you've got to have it at a certain spot. It, so you're working in those two factors. It's it's hard to kind of figure out how to do that. But I agree with you. 28 straight weeks is it is certainly a grind. And you talk to people in the garage, and then that is the first thing they will tell you is like, man, 28 straight weeks? Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, before we go, anything else you want to mention charters, anything like that? I know we got um, some talk going on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, teams got, teams got an offer from NASCAR last week. Uh, they are expected to, uh, have a meeting this week to go over it. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say I'm, uh, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> it feels like everybody, and this, this whole charter thing is all about who you talk to. Uh, one end of the spectrum, people are like, yeah, I could, I could see a deal getting done. And, and there's some optimism of maybe a deal could be on the horizon. And then there's other people who are like, no, no, we're, we're far away. So I don't know. Take it for what it's worth. But teams did get an offer from NASCAR. Uh, they're going to discuss it and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. All right, everybody, plenty more to come. But I did want to say as well, thank you for all your suggestions about what we should do for the poll bet. I got like literally dozens of DMs, I think. Uh, this week we didn't get a chance to sort through them all but like i said jordan and i have a four and a half hour car ride down to atlanta on friday so we will we will decide what we're playing for with the poll bet and announce it uh on the post atlanta podcast um next sunday night um in the meantime check out uh again our, our bonus podcast coming up this week um after media day and of course we appreciate all of you for listening We will talk to you very soon again next time on The Teardown. See everybody.